see. I'll let you know whenever you're on. All right, you are now live. Well, Happy New Year, everyone. Um, Jamie Kaufman here. This is Dr. Kaufman's Acid Reflux Hour. Um, I think this is the fourth or fifth we've done. Last time we covered um, chronic cough to some extent. And uh, because the changing of the year, this year, I'm, this, this uh, uh, session, I'm going to talk about acid reflux, the state of the art. And I'm going to actually focus on four things. I'm going to focus on um, gastroenterologists. Um, you'll find my uh, blog next week interesting. Um, the title is Respiratory Reflux, a.k.a. LPR. Why doesn't my gastroenterologist know about this? Um, which is meant to be provocative. And I'll, I'll explain it to you. And then I want to talk again about proton pump inhibitors, where we are with that. And then I want to talk about something uh, called nosology, which is actually uh, a classific classification of medical terms. And I want to talk about our terms that we use and, and the fact that, for example, Google doesn't recognize LPR, respiratory reflux. Everything falls into the acid reflux bucket. So I want to thank all of you. Um, I was so shocked to see that we're, um, the, the blog uh, site's getting uh, um, half a million uh, uh, hits, uh, a half a million, I don't know what it is, hits or visits a month. Um, and um, so this, this, is, this is my goal. Um, for those of you who know me personally, I consider myself to be two things. Um, happily, I am at my core an educator. And in addition, um, I think about myself as being a, an intrepid warrior. And I have had to be. I've been speaking um, as a lone wolf in the, in the uh, respiratory reflux wilderness now since the 80s. And if you look at my curriculum vitae, which I'm not so much wanting to show off, but if you look at the lectures that I've given and where I've given them, you'll see the, in the titles, you'll see the kind of information I've been providing for years, and most of it's in the peer-reviewed literature. So um, I have uh, uh, and now at this stage in my life decided that the internet is just as important as, as writing new books, although I am writing on, a, working on a new book. So I'm sad to report the state of the art of reflux is abysmal. And there are a lot of reasons for that. First, the typical symptoms that people know about are heartburn and indigestion for esophageal reflux. And we've been looking at the data uh, coming out of my uh, institution now. And for every patient who has heartburn and indigestion, um, there are four people who have res respiratory reflux. And you know, I'm using the term respiratory reflux as a synonym for LPR because laryngopharyngeal reflux is a mouthful, means larynx throat reflux. So um, the, the real question is, why is this so, it's big, it's a big problem. 100 million people have a respiratory reflux. And some of the discoveries that I've made um, haven't been put in the peer-reviewed uh, journals. For example, there's an intense relationship between long-standing silent nighttime reflux and snoring and sleep apnea. I can look inside people. If you have snoring and sleep apnea, I'll look at the blog on snoring and sleep apnea. Um, uh, same thing with sinus disease. Right now, there's a real problem going on with ear, nose, and throat doctors. So they have a procedure called balloon sinuplasty, but I can put this in and then inflate the balloon and empty out the sinus. Um, it's being done where it shouldn't be done. And part of it, in my opinion, is the um, laxity of the, of, the, of the radiologist, perhaps intentionally. So if someone has mucoperiosteal thickening, which just means the lining is thick in the sinus, they report that as chronic sinusitis. And then that gives the ENT uh, permission um, to do a balloon sinoplasty. So I think this particular procedure is being uh, much abused, um, overused, and has, it should have very limited applications. 
But as you know, um, what specialists do best is make money. And so that's why you see all the money going into, into procedures and medical devices and so on, because that's where the money is. So the real question is not that otolaryngologists are uh, doing too much uh, sinus surgery, but it gets back to the question of the gastroenterologist. So a little history here. Um, my birthday when I became 75, um, I, I said to myself, um, uh, I've lived three quarters of a century and now I have to think about that as a whole, as a, as a continuum. Um, and so when I grew up, um, there was no fast food, there were no soda machines, there weren't very many specialists, there were mainly you know, sur surgeons and, and um, some, some specialization and some internists, some of whom were more into GI and uh, uh, pediatricians, but the specialists exploded. And the specialist of gastrointestinal specialists exploded starting in the mid-70s when Olympus made available those long scopes that you can look up from below for colonoscopy or, or, or down from above for EGD, esophageal gastroduodenoscopy, which is an upper endoscopy. So the, the number of gastroenterologists went from 5,000 like to 25,000. Because there's money in them there, Hills. And then the gastroenterologist said, you know, we need our own facility so we can get the facility fees. And I remember in North Carolina 20 years ago when you needed a certificate of need, they petitioned to say, we don't need a certificate of need. We're going to save so much money not doing these in the hospital. So now uh, most or 40% or, or, or of the surgery centers are owned by gastroenterologists. So the GI model is a business model. You stick scopes down people, you get to bill for the procedure, you get to bill for the facility fee because you take biopsies, you keep the uh, 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 pathologist in work, and as far as uh, the anesthesia, you hire nurse anesthetists with uh, maybe one old uh, uh, doctor or anesthesiologist to sign off on the charts. So we have facilities that are owned and run by gastroenterologists for the purpose of doing endoscopy. Meanwhile, it's the heartburn business model, okay? Starting in the 80s, even when I started to produce some of my first work, the story was reflux is heartburn, heartburn is reflux, it's esophageal, and we own it. And so uh, now we have a multi-billion dollar business sticking scopes in people. In my opinion, that ought to stop and go away. But actually, there's been such collusion and corruption to basically beat down the newer, better technology that it really is, uh, in, in my opinion, sinister. So, e e ENTs, um, who ought to be uh, knowledgeable about, most knowledgeable about uh, respiratory reflux, um, they don't really get anything in their curriculum. Um, the go-to doctor for reflux is still a GI doctor. And so um, the, the big problem is that all the medical specialists who deal with the respiratory tracts don't recognize uh, that reflux is a major player. Snoring and sleep apnea, um, uh, allergists and, and uh, pulmonologists, lung doctors. So I'm telling you that 70% of these diseases, in 70% of you, are reflux caused. And most of it's silent nighttime reflux over a period of many years. Okay? Now, so, okay, the doctor says, you know, the, the GI says, oh, let's do reflux testing. And they're going to do impedance testing. Or the ENT says, we can put something in your nose and measure reflux. And the technologies are impedance testing and res tech testing. I can tell you both of these technologies are dogs with fleas. Um, neither one of them is accurate. When I was in practice, I was in private practice and I had a custom pH catheter made so I could measure acidity here and in the esophagus as well. Uh, this was an ISFET chip. ISFET's the chip you get if you get an expensive pH meter. So the only real data in the history of, of, of medicine, in my opinion, uh, came from my laboratory before 
And what, and what we found was uh, that all these people had reflux, whereas they came with their impedance study, which was normal. So doing esophageal testing for respiratory reflux is worthless. And uh, doing a ResTech test, we did. We found 68% false positives in examining criteria for that. So both of those technologies are no good. So one of my my hopes for next year is that we can get inside Medicare and increase reimbursement for reflux testing, because what happened is the catheter that I used with the ISFET chips that I threw away cost more than twice as much as the reimbursement Medicare paid for reflux testing, pH monitoring. And so obviously in private practice, I could charge more. And indeed, I charged a lot more than $175. But Medicare is how prices are determined. And doctors do business plans. And most say reflux testing is just not worth it. Requires a skilled person to put the thing in. Um, patients don't like it, and we get reimbursed. I can't remember the number, but it's it's right around $100 for reflux testing. So we don't have reflux testing, neither GI nor ENT. The go-to doctor is the gastroenterologist. And by the way, the gastroenterologists just poo-poo um, respiratory reflux. Um, I know the opinion leaders in GI, and they know who I am as well. Um, one of the consultees that I did uh, relatively recently saw one of the top people in the country um, several times with the respiratory reflux symptoms, which he clearly has. He clearly has reflux. Uh, anyway, pH study was normal, blah, blah, blah. The doctor ended up yelling at the patient, telling him to go away. Um, they didn't want to see him anymore. So there is a tremendous resistance among gastroenterology to give up the heartburn business model. So when you start looking at the problem, the problem is the go-to doctor is essentially ignorant and has no test for reflux, and all the others that take care of the respiratory tract, like the ENTs and the pulmonologists, don't, they don't really know. So it's not in anybody's curriculum. Now comes a part which is really, own, uh, really obnoxious. When transnasal esophagoscopy, I used to do uh, numb up the nose and have the patient swallow an ultra thin, beautiful examinations. Patient did not have to go to sleep. Um, actually, superior examinations, fewer false positive Barrett's. Um, nothing about EGD was better in any way. Um, of course, n no deaths. One out of 9,000 people dies in one of those surgery centers of a complication of anesthesia. One out of nine. Uh, that's a, a lot of people that have died over the course of, uh, whatever is it, 50 years. So the transnasal esophagoscopy, um, when it came out, Medicare was smart and it, it, it paid more for it than when a doctor looked inside um, in a surgery center that, that he or she owned. And the reason is there was no facility fee. So many years ago, um, Medicare said we want to review the endoscopy codes and reimbursement for those codes. And um, I can't remember his name. It began with B. I want to say it was like Brian or something like that. But anyway, he was the head GI guy. He got transnasal esophagoscopy included. And what happened as a result is transnasal esophagoscopy, which is the future of endoscopy, got demoted. It only gets like $83, but they get a facility fee, which they shouldn't get. So you ought to be able to go to your doctor's office and have a, an esophagoscopy done without being put to sleep. And by the way, as far as colonoscopy, we now have the colo guard. So, um, punchline, when it comes to reflux, gastroenterologists are like dinosaurs, but unlike dinosaurs, uh, they perhaps should die out. So we need a whole new paradigm. In my paradigm, future paradigm, I want to train primary care physicians in integrated air digestive medicine. And so instead of seeing five specialists, you'd see one doctor for allergies, for reflux, for asthma, for, for chronic non-pulmonary cough, um, for, for heartburn, bloating, all, all, the, all the symptoms of the air digestive tract that are all connected, most of them, to reflux disease. 
the beatdown of transnasal esophagoscopy by the gastroenterology leadership is wrong. This technology should replace, should replace sedated endoscopy for reflux. Furthermore, in my opinion, in the future, it'll be done by your primary care physician. In, in a primary care physician group, there'll be 10 of them, and three of them will be good at looking inside here, and one of them will be good at doing the whole endoscopy. And you'll only see a gastroenterologist if there's something wrong or a consultation is needed for some reason. So the, the primary care physician is going to practice integrated air adjusted medicine. We'll talk more about that in a second. So um, there, there is a link um, to transnasal esophagoscopy. You'll see about Joan Rivers' death. I was very angry. Um, I knew Joan Rivers. Um, my personal assistant, um, who I loved when I went to New York, but I left Joan Rivers to come to me. And so I got to meet and know Joan Rivers, and, and her death was, a, 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 was awful. And um, could, it was preventable, in my opinion. So there it is. So now we get back to the lack of recognition of respiratory reflux. I want to start by criticizing search engines. So we've used the word laryngopharyngeal reflux, or LPR, in the medical literature now for well over 20 years. And if you look at articles on reflux, everything falls into the basket. Let's just say you get a, a Google alert. And I, have, I, get, I get Google alerts every day for LPR, acid reflux, and a chronic cough, and 100% and, and of the articles come through on acid reflux. So the first thing is that, that Google and the search engines don't recognize that there is this whole constellation of disease which is separate than GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease, associated with heartburn. It's bought into the GI model, the search engines. And the term respiratory reflux, which I came up with now, what, 2017, which is a pinnacle term, um, is completely unknown. So when you talk about uh, reflux here, for the gastroenterologist, it's esophageal reflux, and for us, it's respiratory reflux, uh, aka LPR. So the fact that there's no recognition in the other specialties is a combination of how the, how the literature and the availability of information comes to them, plus there's nothing in their curriculum, and finally the go-to doctor is the gastroenterologist, who is at best ignorant and at worst antagonistic to the whole idea of respiratory reflux. So I want to finish by talking about this, about this is state of the art, and then I'm going to make a few recommendations and answer some questions before time runs out. Um, proton pump inhibitors are a multi-billion dollar business. If I'm not certain, about 30 million Americans are on proton pump inhibitors. So the first thing you need to know is the proton pumps in your stomach make acid, they swap a potassium for a hydrogen ion. But you have proton pumps in your kidneys, in your heart, in your brain. Um, and we know that there are complications, including sudden death, related to proton pump inhibitors. Secondly, a very, very important article, I have a blog about it, do, do PPIs cause cancer? And the answer is, they are not carcinogenic in and of themselves. But when people take PPIs long term, the disease goes rampant. The PPI just takes care of the symptom for about 57% of heartburners. So what happens is, is, is that, that, that long term PPI is associated with increased risk of esophageal cancer. It is my hope that some attorney somewhere will hear this and start a class action suit. Here's the suit. People who have been on PPIs for years get esophageal cancer. And they thought they were taking a medicine for the reflux that would prevent them from having complications. So I think that class action suit will start to bring down PPIs. And I believe PPIs should be removed from the market entirely. Um, they cure 0% of people, and I stopped using PPIs um, in 2014, and I've successfully treated um, thousands of people. So the, pro the proton pump inhibitor is a, is, a, is a political issue because there's so much money involved, and essentially medicine is about money. So um, 
what am I going to do about it? So that's 2023, the year in review. Um, it's not a very pretty picture if you follow my drift, which I'm sure you did. Um, I'm writing a book, Respiratory Reflux. Um, in that book, there's going to be an outline of the curriculum. Um, it's integrated air digestive curriculum. And if you want to see what I have to say about that, go to YouTube, Jamie Kaufman, The New Field of Integrated, it's Aerodigestive Medicine. It's a 40-minute talk that I gave at Boston University uh, School of Medicine uh, the June before COVID. That's the future. That's, that's what you need to know about reflux and the vagus and all of that. Um, so I'm writing this book, and I'm going to have the, the curriculum. It's all to be done without color photographs and all that. Meanwhile, I think I'm going to do the curriculum additionally and separately um, in, a, in, in an ebook for physicians. They can download it and they get all the color, and I don't have to worry about them buying a $200 or $300 book. I want to get inside Medicare. I'm starting to line up politicians that I can have conversations with. The Medicare dollar is, the, is a zero-sum game, okay? That's the dollar. And how it gets divided up, let's just pretend there's a table. And around that table are mostly people who have vested interests. They're, they're stakeholders. So when you look at all these experts in the field, the gastroenterologist, the pulmonologist, the general surgeon, all these people, their job is to maintain the income of their membership. If they don't, they'll get thrown out and someone else will put in. So inside Medicare, we need to remove people who have vested interests in seeing how money gets spent, start putting in people who really understand public health, and put in people who see options for change. And obviously, integrated air adjusted medicine in the hands of primary care physicians, with the primary care again being the gatekeeper, um, a good one that gets paid enough. Um, uh, in my opinion, we could save a trillion dollars in health care. By, by transforming, getting the specialists, the expensive specialists out of the mix. Just as an aside, a calculation was made about, uh, I don't know, we did it about eight years ago. Um, patients got all their stuff together. So the average patient who came to me with non-pulmonary chronic cough had been coughing for 10 years and spent in excess of a quarter of a million dollars. I mean, not necessarily all out of pocket. That's the CT scans and the allergy testing and all the other stuff. So I want to write the curriculum. I'd like to try to start working to uh, influence uh, Medicare if possible. I'd like to offer some training courses um, uh, for otolaryngologists and primary care physicians, perhaps. And then the final thing is um, I'm going to do more videos. The, uh, a lot of people don't read so much anymore. The books aren't as important. I need to put the Respiratory Reflux book out is what, what is a legacy book that will be read again in 10 years by somebody new. But I think that, that, that the videos are going to be important. And I'm going to do topics and I'm going to do uh, blogs and I'm going to also at some point tell my story, so sort of how I connected the dots um, in the time since the 70s and it started in the 70s. Um, Finally, um, I, I did finally twice, but the real finally is um, it's my goal to have uh, 2 million people visit uh, the blog next year. Um, and I don't know how many million people look at the, look, I don't know how many people look at the YouTube. But I want to reach as many people as possible. And in reaching people, I call this the Viagra effect. Um, why did Viagra advertise on TV? It's a prescription item. So what happened, there was enough pressure from patients asking for it that it became part of the, uh, yeah, we're going to pay for it, and yeah, we can write prescriptions for you for uh, uh, erectile dysfunction. So what I'm saying to you is you're part of a movement uh, to make some changes, not only to healthcare but to the, uh, to the food industry as well, and uh, getting rid of trans fats. A lot of things are happening in that area. So um, I only have a few minutes left, and... Um, um, I am, uh, I remain an intrepid explorer, and I'd like to answer some questions. And the questions this week were really good. Uh, and this question gets asked a lot. Is there a link with uh, menopause or, or, or premenopause and reflux? And the answer is, 
I don't know, but I don't think so. Remember that I've taken care of thousands and thousands of patients and I'm not hearing from patients, you know, this all began when I started having um, menopausal symptoms. So although this is a common question and although it may have a, be a link in some people, um, to my knowledge, it's not a link, uh, menopause and reflux. My GI, this is from Sue, my GI stretches my esophagus during my endoscopy, do I feel better, I feel better from it and swallow easier. Your thoughts on this practice? Well, strictures occur if you've got a severe esophageal reflux. So if you stop the reflux, you'll, you'll probably stop stricturing. So the answer to the question is the first thing to be done is to get the reflux under control. You need to look at my site, you need to be eating early, uh, you know, get on uh, uh, you know, Gaviscon Advance and uh, Fomotidine and uh, a low acid, low fat diet. And, and I mean, you, you, ought to, you, you, ought to, you ought to be doing it for a six month trial, the minimum. So, um, and see if that doesn't uh, stop the restructuring. I don't know how often you're having it done, but it certainly um, should only be when you become symptomatic. It shouldn't be on a schedule. Ooh, let's do this every six months. So the next question is important and also relates to this whole question about severity of reflux. Paul wants to know what role does esophageal motility play in LPR? Is it a likely cause of reflux or is it a symptom? And the answer is um, I have been doing a high definition manometry since the 80s. And um, the majority of people who have respiratory reflux have normal motility. That's the ability of the esophagus to contract and move stuff down the pipe as it should. On the other hand, I've seen people who look like they have a dead tube, where there's no movement, no uh, muscular contraction. And I've seen those people come back to absolutely normal esophageal motility with treatment of the reflux. So the answer is, although there are diseases that cause dysmotility, such as achalasia, that's one in a thousand people. The other 999 have dysmotility, or the other 900 will say, um, because they have reflux, and if you fix the reflux, the dysmotility will go away. Remember my vicious cycle. The more you reflux, the worse your valve works. The worse your valve works, the more you reflux. This is nighttime nocturnal. Nocturne. The more you reflux, the esophageal function becomes impaired, and finally the upper valve kicks out. When you lie down at night, what's in your stomach is in your esophagus, is in your throat, and it's off to the races. So I think motility is important. Um, by the way, um, since a, a, a reflux testing is so bad, I'm going back to a test we used in the 80s, which is the barium swallow esophagram, which will show a lot of stuff. If you have any congenital abnormalities, if you have strictures, if you have um, a, a, a problem swallowing because the upper valve is not working properly, if you have a, a, a dysmotility, that'll show. And it's non-invasive, you go to the radiology suite and so on. So um, I'm going to make this my last question, which is related are esophageal spasms caused by acid reflux? And the answer is yes. And the esophageal spasms um, can produce um, sort of not crack or esophagus, a crushing chest pain. Um, I don't know if you ever had your blood pressure done and they put the cuff up too high so it hurt. That's at 300 millimeters of mercury pressure. And those are the kind of pressures we see in people with esophageal spasm. So for all of you who have reflux, both esophageal disease and respiratory reflux, GERD if you will, and respiratory reflux, you are going to have to be um, the, uh, the movers of, of the needle on this one. And I think it's going to be a grassroots movement because doctors don't change their plans until they can get reimbursement for doing it some other way. Um, I'm going to answer one last question because I think it's an important one that comes up over over and over again. And that is, does stress cause or impact reflux? And the answer is yes. Um, if, I wrote an article on the Vegas recently. Um, it really wasn't meant to be read by everybody. I wanted to put it out in the, in, in the, in, in the blogosphere. Um, but um, uh, everything's run by the Vegas. You faint by the Vegas. You get... Uh, uh, you know, irritated and refluxed by the vagus. So the vagus is the control system and it's connected to other parts of the brain, including the emotional ones. So I want to thank you all for listening. A lot of material today. 
Um, I hope this year, at the end of the year, when I give a report for 2023, I'll have more positive to say. Thank you. I'll see you next time.